Welcome to Cyber Frontier, bringing you the latest news, trends, and hottest topics that focus on advances in cybersecurity and cyber industry economics. Our expert yet down-to-earth hosts make cybersecurity straightforward. They ask the tough questions and make this challenging topic something that everyone can understand. Our candid approach lets guests open up on topics we would all like to see addressed. You can find us on the web at newcyberfrontier.com. That's www.newcyberfrontier.com. Now join today's host as he introduces the topic for today's new Cyber Frontier. Welcome everybody back to the new Cyber Frontier. I'm Sean Murray. I'm going to be your host for this session. We have Tim Weil. He is a cyber security professional uh, as his claim to fame for a security feeds LLC. He is also the chair of the Denver IEEE chapter of the Communications Society. Uh, welcome to the show, Tim. You know, you've been in the space for a, a long time doing all kinds of different things uh, over your career. Why don't you give us a little bit about your background? Well, thank, thank you, Sean. It's a, a pleasure to be back with uh, New Cyber Frontier. You guys run a great show. Uh, you know, funny story is I had a uh, alumni, college alumni meeting uh, Zoom, of course, with some friends uh, last weekend. Uh, and we're talking about the 70s now. And when I talk to you about my background, uh, the, I've got a Jekyll and Hyde background. I have uh, 30 years, or I should say about 20 years in, in humanities and in uh, public education. I was an inner city school teacher. Okay. In my mid 20s, I said, you know, can't solve all life's problems. I came to Boulder, Colorado, like so many, and hung out and had a party for about six years. <laughs> uh, when I woke up in the early 80s, uh, Sean, I started getting some professional skills in data processing. You know, so many of us, COBOL programmers, IBM, mainframe, did that for a few years in Colorado. And then I said, kind of boring and decided to challenge myself, go back to a university system. So at the ripe age of 30, I started a undergrad or a graduate program in uh, computer science, Chico State. Funny thing is I walked in with COBOL skills and realized I knew nothing about uh, computer science, right? Classic line, I was in a class, I think this is like mid eighties and the professor says your first homework assignment is to write a Hamming code algorithm in Turbo Pascal. I raised my hand and I said, I got two questions. What's a Hamming code and what's a Turbo Pascal? All right. <laughs> a lifetime later, I've been in the industry 40 years. I, I cut it this way. I said, I did about 10 years of software, uh, 10 years of networks, got into um, program and project management and then I've had an elevator ride in uh, cybersecurity since the late 90s. I got into cybersecurity when all my Cisco router switching skills kind of leaked out of my competence and I started doing CISSP training in the federal sector uh, early, about 2002 or stuff like that. Been back in Colorado 10 years. I have managed the US Antarctic program I have done risk management for federal agencies. I started a line of business for coal fire in um, ISO 27001, and just recently completed a four-year gig with alcohol monitoring systems, doing a complete ISO 27001 implementation across all their products lines. And that's enough boring stuff to get us started anyways. Yeah, so, um, you know, Lots of years of experience, which uh, leads into other disciplines, which, um, you know, these are the conversations I have with, with other colleagues with, with this level of experience is, you know, we watch technology evolve um, and we watch technology evolve into other types of technology. And then, you know, uh, along came this information assurance, uh, information security. It really is all still just information security. We've rebranded it now into what we call this new sexy term of cyber security, right? Uh, because 80% of our, our, our 
business processes are automated. Um, ISO 27001, it's great to have a conversation uh, related to uh, an international standard that we don't get a lot of visibility here in the United States. Um, the Missouri lottery system is uh, recently um, adapted to the 27001 uh, um, uh, certification. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about 27001 uh, and then we'll we'll go back and we'll probably bounce around in, in different areas because with the amount of experience you've got and you're a published author, um, you know you're an engineer, you're a, uh, you know you're a software guy. Um, there's lots of things moving around in your brain, and if you're like me, they sometimes they collide, and sometimes uh, they land together, and so uh, that's where great ideas come from. So tell us about twenty seven thousand one. Right. Okay, well, there's two stories there. One is, I, when I finished this Antarctic contract early 2010-12, I kind of rolled into the coal fire company, which was a really, it's still a marquee uh, provider today in the audit and compliance pen testing space. And they wanted to set up an ISO 27001 line of business. And like so many um, experiences I've had in my career, it all starts off with somebody showing me like a, a blank piece of paper. And, you know, it's like, you know, put your idea here. Right. <laughs> I can't right. tell you the number of times I've started, uh, you know, a business or a contract with that impulse, the blank piece of paper. At the end of the day, there is a certification process, not for a company to be branded, I'm ISO 27001, but for a certification body to be accredited uh, by international standards groups like the ANAB or the UKAS, right? So end of story was I helped uh, coal fire set themselves up as a certifying body. And then I did some piecemeal contracting with them in the Bay Area. A couple of uh, uh, companies who were having fits and starts and getting their ISO uh, 27001 together. So there were maybe a half a dozen companies I just sort of uh, got started with. Fast forward, you know, it is in our business, interesting when you go from international to national, right? Because when you go into, say, a federal agency, this kind of a standard is not um, lingua franca. It's not something people talk about very much. Right. But if you're selling products and services in an international market, it is not an optional uh, uh, certification. Your companies, your services, uh, in order to sell and be accredited and all those RFPs, you know, have to have that good housekeeping seal of approval. So what is it? It is the management of information security systems. They call it the ISMS. And the standard itself is very generic. You could certify a toaster in your kitchen. You could certify Chase Manhattan Bank. The standard is basically a framework says we define for a company, a product or line of services that their customers want to have assurance for, and then create basically a risk management, management level system for looking at the security controls within a specific domain. Maybe it's a software as a service product. Maybe it's a platform as a service product and I ask, maybe it's just a software application. So ISO 27001 scopes 360 degrees, the management of information risk, and then be able, it then allows you to get accredited, certified by a third party and have attestations through your marketing and your sales outreach that you have a certain level of compliance. That's a good place to start. That's, that's awesome. Um, we're talking to Tim, uh, Wheel. He is the uh, chair of the Denver IEEE chapter of the uh, Communication Society. He's also a cybersecurity professional uh, at Security Feeds LLC. We're going to come back and we're going to have a, a further discussion with Tim right after this break. Cyber Resilience Institute helps build strong cyber communities designed to prevent members from attack. Like building a neighborhood watch, it takes coordination and a sharing community to protect our identities and valuables in the virtual world. 
Typically, we hear that organizations know they need to do something to protect their cyber assets, but don't know where to begin. Let Cyber Resilience Institute help your community create an action plan. Cyber Resilience Institute will build your community or business marketplace so that it is designed to support a collective cyber defense. Contact them for more information at cyberresilienceinstitute.org. Welcome back, everyone. This is Sean Murray with the new Cyber Frontier. We have Tim Weil all the way uh, from Boulder, Colorado. Beautiful backdrop there. Uh, Tim, welcome back to Colorado. Uh, cybersecurity professional over at uh, Security Feeds LLC. Uh, done a lot of work with uh, IEEE chapter um, up in Denver as well. Um, we were just having a discussion on uh, an organization, uh, especially outside of the United States. There are some inside, but uh, a professional, um, uh, uh, a professional credential that an organization can achieve. Just like ISO 9000 was focusing on quality, right? In, in TQM, uh, you can actually attain a certification for your organization, be ISO certified, a credential. Um, that it basically tells your partners or, or, or other organizations that you take information in cybersecurity um, seriously and, and earn that credential through a certifying body. Um, so, um, so we talked about the business aspect of it. What if I wanted to help an organization? You said you just did a project that was four years of doing implementation for an ISO uh, 27001 ISMS. Um, what would it take for a professional to, to actually contribute to an ISMS uh, implementation? Great question, Chris. Uh, excuse me. Great question, Sean. You know, your label comes up, Chris, on our, our talk. <laughs> I know. But um, just to make a point, it did not require four years to uh, accredit uh, the companies that we're working with. Okay. The time cycles can be, you know, realistically six to nine months to get up and running in an ISO environment. And then the reason I have the extended work recently is because as the culture of a company absorbs the risk management ISO 27001 products, they bring other services in. And so it becomes a flywheel not just a static point in time uh, look at a system. And so what you get in place are sort of the um, management and operational procedures that would do internal audits, that would do the pen tests, that would do the documentation updates, that would do evaluations of new systems, and fundamentally to bring in the ability to do risk management, risk assessment as sort of company DNA. Okay. Okay. So to your question about what's it really take, uh, it takes training, of course. And as you and I discussed earlier, um, here in September, I'll be doing lead implementation training uh, in ISO 27001. I'm really looking forward to doing some online classes. And even though by the time we broadcast, uh, that class will be over, I expect we'll be doing uh, periodic uh, updates, both in the ISO 27001 audit space and in the, the lead implementer. So training is one, right? Two is to bring in people with the right competencies. Sure, absolutely. Being And when the right competencies are is maybe you come from a background where you have an ISACA, you know, cert, uh, certified auditor credential, right? Or maybe you come from, you know, uh, corporate structures where you've done assessments across all different product lines, PCI or HIPAA or NIST. So you know the assessment DNA stuff. What's similar between the two is, you know, you're going to write a body of policies and procedures, not necessarily from scratch. You'll buy a template package or get an automated tool. You'll put together a management team that will have sort of ownership of this business process. And then the day one uh, exercise, what takes the couple of months to get running, Sean, is that you do an organizational risk assessment. So you look at the scope of, here's my software, here's my IS platform, here's my hardware, here's my manufacturing hardware, if you would. 
And the risk assessment leads itself into the control, much like these other cycles, like in NIST risk management framework, you know, evaluating the controls, doing the internal audits, making corrections. And so in the sort of old fashioned way, I say old fashioned because the standard has been changing. We have this cycle called plan, do, check, act. The plan, do, check, act says you plan, you write the documents, you create the organization. Do says you put these controls in place using primarily the ISO 27002 annex. That's 114 controls. Then what do you do for the um, plan, do, change? You modify your systems in response to uh, internal audits and findings and vulnerabilities. The ACT thing is continuous improvement and that's sort of an organizational flywheel. Let me stop there for a second, see if that, you know, hits the answer to your question. Absolutely. So it's, it, you know, for those listeners that uh, are not international or familiar with ISO 27000, it is another framework. Um, and in some instances, especially internationally, it may be mandatory. A lot of people in the United States, they're used to a very specific industry standard, as you mentioned, like PCI um, has its own framework. If you're working in healthcare, you're going to have HIPAA, you're going to have high tech. If you're in the government space, which both of us have worked in, um, you're going to have uh, NIST. NIST is, the, is you know, I shouldn't say the new framework. It, it's relatively new for the Department of Defense, but the rest of the federal government has been using it um, uh, for quite a while. And it falls directly under uh, FISMA, which which uh, allows us to uh, better understand our, our our security posture um, for the federal uh, enterprise. So it came out in 2002, uh, the same time as Sarbanes Oxley did. Another framework, uh, GLBA, uh, Graham Leach Bliliac in in the finance industry, and then all of the FDIC standards and frameworks. So. ISO 27001 uh, 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 derived from an old British or UK standard uh, is very mature um, uh, uh, certification accreditation for organizations. So uh, this is a great time to pause for a break. We're talking to Tim, uh, Tim Wheel. Uh, we, we'll be right back with, uh, with uh, Tim. He is the um, chair of the Denver IEEE chapter of the Communications Society. You'll notice that um, our, 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 our screen is actually including a chat uh, feed that uh, he is contributing to as well with certain links to resources he wanted to share out. We'll be right back after this message with Tim. Welcome back, everyone, to the new Cyber Frontier. My name is Sean Murray. We have Tim uh, Tim Wheel, uh, all the way from uh, Northern Colorado. We're down here in the Springs uh, in the studio. Uh, welcome back to the show, Tim. You know, we're talking about ISO 27001. Uh, you know, the work that you've done uh, for certifying bodies. Um, but there's also uh, some training that you were talking about. An organization uh, can become uh, certified and compliant with 27001 and achieve that credential, but so can uh, individuals. So that requires some uh, additional training. Uh, you had, you had uh, mentioned an alignment with, so if I have a, a CISA or I have an auditing background, maybe a, an ISO 27001 lead auditor uh, might be a credential that I'd want to achieve uh, through, through um, your training. Uh, lead implementer, so uh, again, another credential um, that looks at, you know, from a project management perspective, how to implement an ISO 27001, starting with, you know, 27001, the, the, the actual ISMS, 27002 being the controls digest, the implementation plan, 27003, audit metrics, you know, 27,004, information security uh, management, uh, risk management, 27,005, and there's a whole bunch of others, right? So they all um, uh, come together to provide 
uh, a credential and a, a sound body of knowledge for an individual to be credentialed as well. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, just as a sidebar, one of the, I have sent you two links here, uh, Sean, one them. of which is sort of the broadcast for this first class in Lead Implementer. Another one is the Denver ISACA chapter, which interestingly enough is broadcasting my classes. But likewise, one of the very hot topics is something called uh, privacy information management systems, which is the ISO 27701 standard. And I was having a conversation this week even with a very uh, advanced uh, privacy uh, uh, company and they said, you know, we want to get certified for doing this, you know, privacy management system. Oh, and they tell us we need to start by doing the 27,001. To your point, you know, a lot of this stuff sounds like alphabet soup to your listeners, like you're throwing so many words at us, right? But one of the interesting things in the ISO domain, at least in information technology and engineering, is that 60% of the standards are the same. If you do an ISO 9001 certification for quality management and engineering, or if you do an ISO 14001 standard for environmental safety like OSHA, or if you do a, uh, one more example, I'm showing you the privacy one, um, uh, escapes my, my, my attention for a second, I'll come back. I'll just say, oh, the, um, are for cloud security, okay? They have the 27, 17 uh, series and 18. All of these basically say, once you have this organizational structure in place, you have management awareness of the quality information systems. You have the resources who are educated in what they need to do in, the, in their line of business. Then the process is that you insert the domain of interest. So, for 27,001 training, implementation training, we give people the skills to know the standards, which are roughly sometimes called four to 10, the mandatory standards. We teach them in 27,001 about a catalog of security controls, which that we call Annex A, ISO 27002, or subset of NIST controls. But very important to understand, and I think, Sean, you'd be there already, is at the end of the day, we are not an operational security system. We are not tightening the screws in the cloud and the data center on boxes. We are evaluating what are the policies and procedures in place, and do they cover the gaps in information security that companies uh, want to look at, have a 360 view. A very interesting um, sidebar, Sean, is a lot of my work in the last couple of years was with a company that was a cloud, has cloud first initiatives, heavy data center investments, heavy uh, amount of infrastructure and billing and uh, highly resilient dual data centers and wants an organizational initiative to move these services to the cloud. So I did a lot of writing and lecturing on that very specific problem. How do I take my basic compliance model and re-image it in a cloud environment in a way that's simple and makes sense? Let me stop there for a second. Yeah, and, and so simple makes sense, uh, is pervasive, and you can pass that conversation on to key decision makers so that they better understand why right and so that provides that that level of uh, determination so a certification body can come in not only is it do you have all the mature processes so i'll align that with cmmi right cmmi level three uh the the processes are identified they're they're mature uh, they're documented and they're current right and so from there then i can align to organizational strategy as to why this is important because everything that we do in the business should align to some overall organizational strategy some objective that allows the organization to understand the value of why you want to do it. Um, you've got the DNA, Sean. I could bring you on board tomorrow. <laughs> 
Yeah, it, it's a great conversation. So one of the, I'd like to do a pivot. So great conversation on ISO uh, 27001 as it applies to an organization, as it applies to a professional credential for a career professional. Um, you've got a lot of background with IEEE. You know, you're a, a published author. Um, why don't you give us a, a little bit of a background? What are you doing um, as the chair for the Denver IEEE chapter of the Communication Society? Uh, uh, 60 hours a week in my spare time. <laughs> as a volunteer. Yeah, as a volunteer. You know, that's one of the things my wife and I have talked about over a long time. Uh, we're people of a certain generation who are born with the, we call it the volunteer gene. We look at systems and, you know, things that go on in the world say, let me dive in. What can I do? And be careful when you volunteer, you know, there's no limit to the end of what you can do. But I have as much DNA with IEEE as I do with the 20 companies I have worked with in my career. So it's been a steady growth, steady, exciting career. I have one of the most exciting careers in IEEE that you can ever imagine. Um, what do I mean? Started out by just being a member and getting magazines. Um, started out reviewing some articles for publication. Is this one good or is this one bad? Started out doing some volunteer for local section. By the way, Colorado Springs has an excellent IEEE program as in the state of Colorado does as well. By the time I was done, this guy who was an inner city school teacher became the chair of the Washington DC section for 14,000 members doing conferences, seminars, member uh, improvement programs. I moved back to Colorado. I couldn't walk away. I did it again. I became the chair of the Denver section in 2013 and put on a conference in that era, Sean, that's coming back next year, IEEE Green Tech. Okay, so today at, with the Communication Society, I have a very small team. We, we keep up a website, comsoc, IEEE.denver.org, but by the way, we have won a conference for Denver in 2024. We have won a conference called the International Communications uh, Conference, ICC 2024, that'll bring 1,500 professionals to Denver uh, to engage the industry. That's really exciting. So in the times of disruption that we are having in every way, shape, and form, I treat 2020 is a leap year. It is a leap year. All right, I've already skipped this year. I'm on to next year, right? <laughs> right. And my target is to bring a conference of, of international excellence to Denver in 2024 that's going to be fantastic. But to your point, I also volunteer in the university systems. So I work with the university, uh, DU, and we set up a chapter in blockchain working with the uh, developers community. We do talks and seminars. I have a seminar coming up on of all topics, Sean, transactive energy, transactive energy. What the heck is that? Okay. So I just can't, you know, it's like you say, you sort of, with a lot of industry experience, you have all these things that you're juggling in the air. But you know, at the end of the day, what am I trying to do to represent the communication society? It goes back to Shannon's theorem, which I'm not that kind of a formula guy. I'll say more signal and less noise. That's what we're doing. We're, we're putting out more signal and less noise. And by the way, Sean, I also work with the virtual distinguished lecture program. So Comsoc has a, um, a uh, roster of uh, a couple of dozen of the best professionals in the communication industry. And we organize virtual seminars so they can come and give topics uh, here in Colorado and to your listeners as well. That's a short list and I could go on. Yeah, that's a great contribution. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that you were able to, to share some of the contributions there. Um, yeah, you know, as professionals, I, I was born with the uh, volunteer gene, as you, you mentioned as well. Uh, a lot of my contributions are with uh, 
um, with our ISE Square chapter and our ISSA chapter here in, in Colorado Springs, uh, the two of the largest chapters in the world, uh, right here in Colorado. Denver is the largest. Um, and you know, I wanted to make a difference, so I joined the uh, the board of directors for ISSA International in 2015, and uh, yeah, I've been serving as the COO for the last few years there. Um, I just saw a re reinvigoration of uh, one of our IEEE chapters down here, and so we're working together to try and see what we can do to uh, capitalize on on local resources. Great, uh, great contribution with the uh, the with the conference that's coming. So was that 15,000 uh, folks you're bringing? <laughs> Let's get our decimals right, 1,500. Okay, I wanted to make sure I, I heard 1,500. Uh, right, 1,500, and, but Sean, just to let you know, I've been doing the conference circuit for over 12 years. I produced uh, uh, more than a half a dozen big shows for IEEE. Most recently, we were in Hawaii in 2019. So, and one of the things that I've done is to you know that sort of secret sauce like we're technologists we have products we write papers oh we want to bring industry into the conversation right and so what is that outreach that we all have to do to make our products your issa products or my ieee products look attractive to industry so i've done outreach to uh, corporations over a dozen years i brought more than a million dollars into ieee through these conferences. Yeah, that's awesome. And if there's anything, I'll just say in the in the interview, which is just fantastic to be here today, just uh, networking with a person like yourself embedded in ISSA, um, very special to me because that's an organization I've always seen on the periphery. We always look at each other's flyers and then we say, what can we do? I'm looking to build some synergy there, Sean, and I think, uh, Meeting you today is going to be a way to do that. Yeah, I, I think there's some uh, collaboration that we can continue on. Yeah, you know, we've come to the end of the show, Tim, and uh, I appreciate the contribution, the great discussions. There's so much more, more that needs to be said. So uh, we'll be connecting afterwards and, and continuing that uh, discussion. Um, Tim Wheel. He is the uh, chair of the Denver IEEE Chapter Communications uh, Society. He's also a cybersecurity professional uh, and then some over at Security Feeds LLC. Thanks, Tim, for your contribution today uh, to the show. Sean, a pleasure to be here. All right. Talk to, you, talk to you later. Great. This has been another edition of the New Cyber Frontier. My name is Sean Murray. We'll see you on the next show. Thanks again, Tim. All right. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to New Cyber Frontier. Remember to follow or like our post and circulate each new show to your networks. We keep you informed, bring you the latest news, explore new trends, and find the hottest topics. With New Cyber Frontier, you don't have to be a computer or cybersecurity expert. Just get plugged in. We encourage you to get involved. Tell us what topics interest you and join our mailing lists. You can find us on the web at www.newcyberfrontier.com. That's newcyberfrontier.com. Check out our previous interviews and please let us know if there are any topics that you would like to hear discussed. See you next time on New Cyber Frontier.